Welcome to Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for joining me here today. As news about the fate of J.J. Vallow and Tyree Ryan break our hearts and make us question humanity, a few thoughts race through my mind. Number one, people do some terrible things to children. Number two, people also do terrible things after a terrible thing has happened to a child. We're going to talk about a few particular instances of that on today's Brain Scratch. And they're going to touch on some cases that we've covered in the past. A few weeks ago, a Brain Scratcher reached out to me about a post on social media. A post claiming that an attached photo was of Kyron Horman. And the photo was only from four years ago. For those unfamiliar with the case, Kyron disappeared in Oregon 10 years ago last week and it's heavily suspected his stepmother could be responsible. I'll have links to my previous videos on the case in the description box below. But what if this photo was legit? Could it help us track him down or, at a minimum, provide proof of life that could give his family a renewed hope that he's out there waiting to be found? I headed right over to that post to see what she had found and took a look at it for myself. Here's what it said. You guys, is this Kyron Horman? Photo taken four years ago. Lady posted this pic on Kyle Abashi's Facebook page, who did a story on Kyron a few days ago. He was seven to seven and a half when he went missing. He'd be 18 this September. If this was taken four years ago, that would make him, what, 13 to 14 years old in this picture? Here's a closer shot of the photo. And obviously, the resemblance is uncanny. But right off the bat... I had a pretty strange feeling about the size of his head compared to the rest of his body. To me, it almost looked like a seven-year-old's head had been pasted onto a 14-year-old's body. The shading from the tree looks right. The lighting for the scene looks right. So I figured I just had to try to dig in more and see if I could figure this out. I started trying to trace the original poster. We'll call her Jane. I found a message that she left on the Missing Kyron Horman Facebook group. I have a picture of a kid that looks just like Kyron. His mom never replied to my Facebook message, and this page won't let me post here in the comments. I saw a lot of people trying to get more info from her, and I tried to get to her account. Unfortunately, her account was locked down. The first time I checked it, I couldn't see anything outside of a few pictures. Uh, I checked it again a day later, and then one post could be seen publicly. It was a post that said, yes, I'm the one that posted the picture of Kyron. And then a day or two after that, that post disappeared again, and it was pretty much locked down outside of a few photos. Thankfully, some other people had reached out to her and had a bit more of the story, and they shared some screenshots with each other. This is one of them. Uh, the story is that the original poster's aunt saw this in a fishing magazine. I find it kind of interesting that we don't get any details about what magazine it is uh, or when it was published. And obviously, if you look at the photo for itself, if it was in a magazine, the photo has been cropped and no other details of what was on the same page are now part of that magazine. Um, I don't know. It's it's kind of interesting to me that, hey, I found this picture. I think it looks like this missing kid. Here, I'm going to send you this cropped photo. I mean, why not just send the whole page of the magazine if you're going to scan it? Uh, which is another question to all this. Is this photo scanned? Is it a picture of the photo? It doesn't look like it's a picture of the photo, like taken from an, a phone, taking a picture of a sheet of paper, at least with the amount of detail we're able to see in it. Just a ton of questions, a very simple story, and not a lot of answers. A lot of people were going to Jane, asking her for some more specifics to give a little, a little more detail, asking her what type of follow-ups that she had done. And it seemed like she was mostly preoccupied with trying to get the family to pay attention to her. Um, as a matter of fact, in this message, you can also see that, that the original poster seems most excited that she has finally made contact with Kyron's mother. So I did some overlays of the pic. Basically, I took that picture, I took some other known pics of Kyron, and I laid them on top of each other, and then I adjusted them back and forth so you can kind of see them phase in and phase out. And what I quickly came to the determination of is that face in the photo 
is without a doubt Chiron. But as I kept looking at it, a few things stuck out. His glasses and his ear on the left side of his face in particular are actually a perfect match to the photo that we've all seen the most, the one of him in front of his science project at school on the day that he disappeared. Outside of the shadows falling across his face, it's an exact match. Now, does that really make sense for a growing boy six years after he went missing? We've got no proportional changes going on at all in his face. Something else about the glasses stuck out to me. That line between where the two lenses are, that doesn't seem to match the photo. And if you look at it without the photo overlaid, the line sticks out. It's just too straight. It's too dark. And it doesn't appear to have a shadow. A problem that I was also having in terms of his face proportions, at least with the original photo, is his jaw was not lining up and his teeth looked more corrected in the newer photo than in the known photos. So I decided to try a different picture and bingo. The new age progression pick fits the jaw and teeth perfectly. Once again, not just close, the details line up exactly, including the corner of his smile line on the lower right side. There is no doubt in my mind that the new age progression photo was used as part of this image. Now I've seen a lot of composite sketches and while many are very strong, they would never match up perfectly. They are effectively still artist renditions. What do you guys think? Do you disagree with my assessment on all this? Are you noticing anything else strange about the pic? Please let me know in the comments down below. I checked on things a week later to see if any new developments happened around this picture or what the communication was around it. Some of the original posts are now disappearing. Of course, it seems that no media has picked up on the image. So the original posters page still locked down. But like I mentioned before, there was some photos of different family members that I could see there. I don't know if they're her children or nieces and nephews, um, but I do think there's a possibility and I really don't have anything to point to, to this extremely strongly. I think there's a possibility that one of the kids in those photos could potentially be the body that's in this new picture. Uh, I was also curious about what type of effort this might have taken, and I spent literally a few minutes, seriously, not even long, guys, looking for tools online, and I took that new photo of Chiron, and I used text test pictures against it, and I found tools that very quickly and easily could replace the face and even retain the shading of the original photo. And these tools weren't expensive. Some of them were free and extremely easy to use. So ultimately, I wound up thinking that this could have been done by someone that wasn't even a half decent graphic designer. This could be someone that just knows of a, a couple of decent web tools that pulled this together. So you have a supposedly new photo of a missing boy that pops up one week before the 10th anniversary uh, from a magazine that came out four years ago for some reason. I don't know, but for me personally, I'm really thinking this is a hoax and it's leaving me with one huge question. Why? Why are you going to do this to people? Why do I keep coming across stories about the families that have missing loved ones being targeted in ways like this? I literally hear it time and time again, and it just absolutely breaks my heart. I know that we're all still waiting for the day that we learn the truth about where Chiron is and for justice to finally arrive. Of course, it's one thing to target a family like this, but what about using the name of a missing child to grab attention, possibly to raise money or even help solve other cases? We've recently seen another run of articles related to Madeline McCann. Maddie would have turned 17 last month. I've done a few videos on this case. Once again, they'll be in the description box below. It might be one of the most widely known missing child cases in the world and one of the most divisive. The last time I spoke about this case was in 2017 during the 10 year anniversary when we also saw a blitz of supposed case breakthroughs being reported by the media. 
But my video was more about trying to show the weakness of those points that were being raised, trying to question if the information was truly released to actually help the case, or if it was just another pass at grabbing money from authors, producers, and maybe even some others involved. Uh, at this point, I'd like to also note that this video is not monetized specifically because I want to share my points with you guys and I don't want anyone questioning that I'm doing the same thing. That's not what I'm here talking to you about this for. I know there's other people that have covered the information uh, that has been released about him. Once again, I'm providing a point of view that I have not seen anywhere else. So think back to that 2017 video that I did. There was a lot of points that came up. Do you remember the Australian film crew that was going to release important new evidence on this case within a matter of days? Tons of articles talking about that. And guess what? I went looking for the follow-up articles after their special aired. I can't find any announcements of what this major breakthrough was. But I bet they got the viewers they were looking for by making those promises in media. What about the Portuguese investigator that thought Madeline was taken to caves? Any updates on him searching those caves and discovering any real evidence? No. What about the ex-cop that talked about a rich family taking her when a girl that looked like Maddie was seen in Morocco? The girl that was actually tracked down later and proven not to be her. What about the new theory dropped by Gonzalo Amaral stating that MI5 hid Madeline's body in some sort of conspired cover-up operation? Well, it's now 2020, and we have a new suspect, but let's be clear, we've had several suspects over the years. And is this really a new suspect? According to some people, not really. The Guardian reports, the Metropolitan Police investigation has identified more than 600 people as potentially significant and was tipped off about the German national already known to detectives following a 2017 appeal 10 years after she went missing. Tipped off about someone that they already knew. The man's name is Christian Bruckner, and he's in jail in Germany on unrelated charges. A German prosecutor named Hans Walters told Sky News, the hard evidence we don't have, we don't have the crucial evidence of Madeline McCann's body. We expect that she is dead, but we don't have enough evidence that we can get a warrant. We need more information from people, especially places he has lived, so we can target these places especially and search there for Madeline. Several publications are saying Christian matches an e-fit or a police composite sketch from 2013 that was released, noting his pockmarked face and light hair. Well, here's a compilation of all the e-fits that I've seen related to this case. The one that I refer to as pockmark man has extremely dark hair and hair that really doesn't seem to match up at all with Christians. The ones with lighter hair don't really have the pockmarks that these articles are assigning back to Christian. I do think this one in particular could be a potential match, but honestly, a lot of people could match all these different options that have been thrown out over the years. Reportedly, a friend of Christian's told investigators that he had made some strange comment in a German bar as they were watching coverage about Maddie's abduction during the 10th anniversary. Another person would come forward, an ex-girlfriend, also saying that he made some strange comments. She was actually with him at the time, and she said that a day before Maddie's disappearance, he had mentioned having a horrible job to do in Praia de Luz tomorrow. She also claims that she asked him if he took Maddie, and he replied, just don't go there. At least one of his previous girlfriends also states that he was violent with her. The strongest links that we're seeing with this guy seems that he is a convicted sex offender and has a few charges related specifically to children, though we should acknowledge that link is strong only if you're assuming sexual abuse as a motive for Maddie's disappearance, which honestly we just can't be certain about. Also worth noting, one of his offenses was against a 72-year-old American tourist and occurred in the area and two years before Maddie's disappearance. I haven't found any charges related to abduction specifically, which we can certainly verify with Maddie's case, though criminals do evolve their methods, so I don't think we could exactly write that out. 
He's currently jailed for drug-related charges, and I understand that his conviction for the assault of the 72-year-old woman is being reviewed by German courts. So we have him living in the area at that time, and he also may have been using these particular vehicles. I'm sharing this information just in case it could be helpful. According to info from the New York Post that cites a Portuguese newspaper, an employee at the resort in Praia de Luz had Christian's phone number in their cell phone. Police reportedly believe that that employee tipped Christian off to Maddie's parents being out of the room. Some reports are saying they've tracked a specific phone call between the two that lasted for 30 minutes, about an hour before Maddie disappeared. Some believe the intent was to rob the place and that the abduction of Maddie turned out to be a crime of opportunity. Now, that's kind of one version of the story. Other reports are really conflicting certain pieces of that. They're saying that there was a call to Christian's phone. It did last for 30 minutes, but they don't know the other phone number that it came from. So that means that it might not have been the employee's phone specifically. There was a turn in the case in the past few days. Two lawyers that were representing 43-year-old Christian Bruckner quit after saying that he isn't making any comments about the case. It's understood he's currently being held in solitary confinement, supposedly to help protect him. I'm not sure why he's not making any comments or why he's even in solitary when the prosecutor is telling certain publications that Christian hasn't even been questioned about Maddie's case by investigators. The same prosecutor that said they know Maddie is dead and that he's responsible, a quote that's literally grabbing headlines all over the world, also stated that Christian's connection to Maddie's case is, quote, circumstantial suspicion. According to Gonzalo Amaral, former chief that investigated the case originally, Christian was investigated and dropped from the investigation. I'm hearing rumors that his van was also checked at that time and no evidence was found. German authorities say that he's tied to multiple missing children cases, but they don't have charges against him in any of those cases. Daily Mail has even posted a graphic called Christian Bruckner Timeline that details his actual charges mixed in with the child disappearances they suspect he might be related to. Are we really getting close to learning the truth, or is this lining up someone to take a fall? Admittedly, this is a person that should be in jail for a long time, but would it be justice to Maddie for that to happen while another criminal goes free? This current twist in the case seems all too familiar. Just one year ago, newspapers ran with the headline, New Suspect in Madeline McCann Case is Child-Killing Pedophile, and those articles talked about matching someone also in a German prison to an E-fit. Martin Ney was already serving life in prison when that information broke. Scotland Yard investigators wanted to question him, even though he had already been questioned and denied it. We even had a resort worker that said they saw Ney in Praia de Luge at the time of Maddie's disappearance. Authorities would quickly say Ney wasn't the guy that they were talking about even though the details of the crimes and the sentence that they described match Nay perfectly and they don't match Christian Bruckner. German pedophiles were even mentioned as a possibility by Maddie's mother in her book. But what is the evidence to point us in that direction? I still don't know. Why are we seeing a trend of authorities that are trying to solve this case, spilling information publicly that isn't corroborated or validated? With, with Christian, they haven't even had him interviewed directly about it before all this broke loose publicly. According to Prosecutor Hans Walters, they are assuming that there are more victims and they need people to come forward. So is this really about solving Maddie's case? Or is it using her name to gain publicity to solve other cases? Even the point that he was trying to raise about, hey, we need to know where he was living so we can uh, really work those areas for trying to solve. Is that about solving Maddie's case? He said it was to try to find Maddie, but is that the actual truth? I don't know. Uh, I would think that the place where you want to raise all this attention would be around Praia de Luz. Is there something else at play here? In an article at BBC.com titled, Madeline McCann, New Inquiry Could Be Dropped Without Clues from the Public, 
they have a timeline, and that timeline tells me a pretty interesting story. July 2013, Scotland Yard says it has new evidence and new witnesses in the case and opens a formal investigation. October 2013, detectives in Portugal reopen the investigation, citing new lines of inquiry. January 2014, British detectives fly to Portugal amid claims they are planning to make arrests. December 2014, detectives question 11 people. September 2015, the British government discloses that the investigation has cost more than 10 million pounds. April 2017, four official suspects investigated by police are ruled out. Senior investigators say they are pursuing a significant line of inquiry. November 2018, an extra £150,000 is granted to continue the investigation. It is the latest in a series of six-month extensions which take the total cost of Met Police's operation to an estimated £11.75 million. June 2019, the UK government says it will fund the Met Police inquiry, which began back in 2011, until March 2020. June 2020, police reveal that a 43-year-old German prisoner has been identified as a suspect in Madeline's disappearance. This case has been a cycle of supposed breaks in the case. How many times are we going to hear about new lines of inquiry and dashes of cash infusions for the better part of a decade now? And this latest development comes out three months after funding for this case has supposedly ended. The New York Times states the Met Police Home Office said that it was considering an application for new funding for the 2020 to 2021 financial year by investigators in London. What do you think the chances of that application being filed are? Nearly 12 million pounds spent so far with seemingly more coming, but according to CNN, in an article dated June 4th, 2020, UK authorities are offering a £20,000 reward. That's approximately $25,000 American for information leading to the conviction of those responsible. The German police, they're offering 10,000 euros or a little over $11,000 American to anyone providing information. The police in Portugal reportedly aren't even working on trying to generate new leads based off this new suspect, seemingly because they ruled him out already. One Portuguese police official commented that there isn't even enough evidence to call this guy a suspect. Another active senior Portuguese police official stated to ABC News, there's no evidence Christian Bruckner has, is involved in her disappearance. This individual was already investigated. Strong enough reasons to charge him were never found. Look, guys. I want to find a way to keep hope alive for this case. I want to believe that justice is coming for this little girl. But what I'm seeing year after year on this case has me questioning if the people running this investigation are really focused on solving it, or are we selling books and documentaries, or possibly are we using Maddie's name to now solve other crimes? Do I think they're going to find more crimes and more charges for Christian? Yeah. By all written accounts, this guy is a career criminal, so the likelihood of that is extremely high. As a matter of fact, we already have an Irish woman that has stepped forward and is asking detectives to see if there's any connection to an attack that happened to her in Praia de Rocha, about 30 minutes away from where Maddie was abducted. And she's doing this based on a description of Christian's attack against the 72-year-old 70, woman. In the latest articles, law enforcement is reporting that they're receiving hundreds of tips since the new appeal. I'm just sitting here wondering how many of those tips are actually about Maddie's case. Is this really the legacy of a toddler that has captured the hearts of the world? Is a point going to come where her name has been misused for so long to help other people's agendas that we won't pay attention when the call for help or info actually tied to her case comes forward? Can law enforcement and the media cry wolf one too many times in the name Madeline McCann? I want to know your thoughts on these latest developments in the comments below. And just to be clear, I know where this case goes whenever we talk about it. I know several people think the family are involved. I know many people are looking outside of that. This isn't about true about trying to prove 
which side is right. This is about raising the question of what's going on in media. Are these organizations really doing their best to serve justice? Or is this about raising more money to keep these investigations going? And if they're really trying to investigate this, if that's really the intent, why are these rewards kind of laughable for a case of this size? I, I don't get it, but I'm looking forward to your feedback. Be safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you again on Monday with a new episode of Case Cracked, an episode that's actually going to remind us some of these missing persons cases really surprise you in the end. I hope that you'll join us back here on the Lord and Arts channel.